this is a great uh, edition of Baseball Digest, and boy, nothing better than reading this great magazine while enjoying this Rocky Patel Edizione Unica with uh, Honduran Jama Strand, with Honduran Binder and Filler, Smoke Cedar, Cocoa, and a slight bit of pepper involved in it. And why not? You say, reading the Baseball Digest right now during Hold My Cutter, coming your way from Burn by Rocky Patel, just a couple of blocks away from PNC Park. Well, why wouldn't Michael McHenry and I be talking about Baseball Digest when we're sitting here with our guest, the editor-in-chief of Baseball Digest, the incomparable media giant, Rick Cerrone. Now you laugh. I laugh. Yeah, you, He's a you, chief. Yeah. Well, you yeah. can't laugh. You're a chief. I don't know what an editor in chief is. Why not just editor? Why not just editor? Why not just, editor? Why not just chief? That's true. Yeah. Just chief. The chief. Yeah. Like, like the Daily Planet. That's it. <laughs> Rick, Rick Cerrone, not only the editor in chief of this historic publication, an iconic baseball magazine, Baseball Digest. He was the vice president of PR for the Pirates from 1987 to 1993. He worked in the commissioner's office at Major League Baseball before joining the Pirates. Uh, he was the longest serving media relations director in Yankee history under George Steinbrenner, a one-time technical advisor of the movie, The Natural. He created a three-hour nightly sports talk show back in the late 80s in New York City called The Sports Connection, a 2022 inductee into the Northern Illinois University Athletic Hall of Fame, and that's just touching the surface of, again, this media giant and one of our great friends, Rick Cerrone, who's back in Pittsburgh. One of the themes that Michael McHenry and I have chosen for our podcast, Hold My Cutter, is how great Pittsburgh is and how people seem to be migrating back to it. Athletes, uh, professional uh, members of, of the media like Rick Cerrone. And Rick, you've decided to come back and live in Pittsburgh. Yeah, my wife Karen and I did. I, I born and raised in New York, uh, other than going to college out at Northern Illinois University back in the 70s. Uh, that's all I knew until I came to Pittsburgh in 1987. And we just loved it. Uh, I went back to New York because the Yankees beckoned, and that was my dream job. Um, but when I I belonged to a cigar belonged to a cigar club in New York, and all the guys are like Pittsburgh. Why Pittsburgh? Mm. Lee Mazzilli, oh, uh, former think, pirate. Pittsburgh. You know, my whole life, I never heard anybody say I'm retiring to Pittsburgh. Well, number one, I'm not retiring. You know, don't get me wrong, I love Pittsburgh. But So when the, when my friends say to me, why Pittsburgh? I say, well, obviously, you've never been there. Yeah. Because if you were here once, and some of the guys in my cigar club, Amen. one of them has a son who currently is enrolled at, at Pitt, so he's here. Uh, some of them have been here. They know it. They're like, oh, it's a beautiful. I once read something when we came here the first time. And remember, at that time, I'm trying to sell this to my wife <laughs> who worked in Major League Baseball. So she said, basically, OK, I'm going to give up my career <laughs> and I'm moving to Pittsburgh. So I remember reading a magazine about Pittsburgh. And somebody said at the time that if Pittsburgh was located in Europe, People would travel thousands of miles to see it. God, what a, you know, it's the well only said, it's yeah. the only city in the in the country, maybe the, with an entrance. <laughs> when you come through that Fort Pitt tunnel on a beautiful day, and you see the, and remember, when when I did it back in the eighties. You saw the mausoleum Three River Stadium that always, you know, if it rained, the outside was wet and it was not a very attractive building from the outside. Now you see the, the Steelers, uh, I, you know, I still call it Heinz Field and you see PNC Park and it's just a magnificent sight and it's got, Pittsburgh has so much to offer. Um, I, I've been here two months now and... Uh, I, I don't miss New York. I, I'm enjoying every aspect of Pittsburgh and all it has to offer. And uh, here I am. You're stuck with me. We won't go necessarily in sequential order. So let's start with <clears throat> Baseball Digest. Right. How are you, the editor-in-chief, or as Michael <laughs> just said, just the chief, just the chief. of Baseball Digest, well, an iconic magazine? You know, Baseball Digest started publishing in 1942 as the little digest size, and I read it every month. I would go to the local Rexall. I don't know why I never subscribed. Now, d d but describe that that book I, for those I, that don't remember. I got it as a kid. It. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It because was it was so print. different. It was mm -hmm. tiny. 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 It was like a Black and white newsprint, and basically... Most, if not all, of the articles were basically lifted with or without permission 
from various newspapers. So I it would did say, not know that. Yeah, I would say this oh. is by Milt Gross, New York Journal American, or Jerome Holtzman, Chicago Tribune. Um, and they would send him a check for $25. But <clears throat> obviously you can't do that today because you pretty much have access to everything in the country on your computer. So we, we now have to have original content and content that if you come out six times a year, which we do, it's got to be something that you're not getting somewhere else. It's a different take on things. You've got to kind of create your own news, things like that. But, you know, I basically, you know, my life has been someone's up there looking out for me <laughs> or it's just happenstance hmm. because you know I'm doing my own thing I left the Yankees in 2006 started my own PR company and I get a, a call from a gentleman that I worked with who had a graphics firm and he said hey how would you like to write for Baseball Digest I'm like I didn't even know they were still around <laughs> <laughs> no I'm not looking to write for different people but and he explained to me that he, he got a call from the new owners of Baseball Digest and they were going to outsource everything. They were shutting down their uh, brick and mortar shop in, in Evanston, Illinois. They were moving on from the editor that they had. And this is what they were going to do remotely. And they wanted him to do all to do everything. Like, turnkey, you provide us six issues a year. I said, well, based on what you're saying to me, you're going to need an editor. That I'd be interested in. So he goes, well, let me take that to the... So he, they talk to ownership, and, and he, my friend Bill Goodspeed calls me back and says, he was so excited. Rick Sarone, we have a chance to get Rick Sarone. I said, whoa, time out. Just so you know. This guy... <laughs> this is not the this, baseball player. This guy clearly thinks that I'm the... Former Yankee catcher with the same name, different spelling, but same name. No, no, no. I said, trust me. He goes, well, listen, I'm, we're going to have a conference. Been there before. We're going to have a conference call. Come down to my office on th whatever, Thursday, 2 o'clock. I go down. His office was in the Empire State Building. We go in a little conference room. He puts me on the speaker, and he, he gets the guy. He goes, Jake, Bill Goodspeed. I'm sitting here with Rick Cerrone. And right away, he goes, and I bet Bill Goodspeed. He, I, I'll Do you bet remember you. what you bet him? I don't remember. Probably lunch or something. But, but um, he said, I'm sitting here with Rick Cerrone. All of a sudden, this, the gentleman at the end of, on the other line, Jake Zimmerman, says, Rick Cerrone, let me tell you something. My memory of Rick Cerrone. I'm, and I'm like, here it goes. Here we go. And he goes, <laughs> when he took over as the vice president of public relations for the Pittsburgh He got you. He, he wow. knew everything about me. So How about that? We talked. And... Um, you know, I went through an interview process. I talked to the longtime publisher, Norman Jacobs, that had published Baseball Digest since 1969. And um, we had a very friend. I was in spring training. So the funny thing is, you know, it was a day in spring training. And I went down there for a week for a couple of PR clients. And I'm sitting by the pool. I'm sitting in a lounge chair and this and that. And I'm, I am I got them. I got them. I'm doing my job interview from the pool at the hotel. <laughs> and I asked them as many questions as they asked me because I wasn't going to get involved with something that, you know, uh, I remember saying to them, I said, I, 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 I see from my research that you've given an MLB player of the year award since 1969, which means this year will be your 50th year of giving. Oh, we're very proud of that. I said, well, Jose Altuve of the Astros won it last year. Right. I said, does he know he won? Huh. <laughs> well, I think so. I said, well, did you give him a trophy? No. Did you put out a press release? No. Huh. We, I'm like, well, right there, we have to monetize. Man. These awards, we've got, we have all these we have rookies of the year, pitcher of the year, relief pitcher of the year, and we went out and we got a co-sponsor, uh, eBay, who's done it for six years, and we created a magnificent. I've given this award to players: Jacob Degrom, Aaron Judge, uh, uh, Max Scherzer, Mookie Betts, and some of them have said to me, "This is the nicest award I've ever." Willie Mays. That's we, amazing. We that created is, yeah. a lifetime achievement award mm. uh, because there is no annual lifetime achievement award in Major League Baseball, There's, and we wanted to honor people that have, you know exemplified the game and all that it stands for and our first recipient back in 2021 was Willie Mays and Willie Mays told us this is the greatest honor I've ever received how about this that? is the well, nicest trophy I'm so you proud imagine the guy with so much hardware that's and amazing I, I gotta tell you a great story wow. real quick so two years ago 
2022, when we first came to Pittsburgh to start looking, my wife and I were traveling up 79, going to the North Hills, I think. <clears throat> and the phone rings. You sound just like the, me, by the, the way. The, yeah. phone, the phone rings over the car, and this 310 area code comes up. And I said, well, I know that's Los Angeles area, but I don't know who it is. So I hit the phone. I said, hello. And on the other end, he goes, Rick, this is Vin Scully. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, oh, Vin, how are you? Rick, I'm just calling to tell you that I just received your beautiful memento. This is as nice as any award. And to think that I would be honored by such a prestigious public. And he went on and on. I'm like, I feel like we're listening to the radio. <laughs> and, you know, he died two months later. So I was so happy to yeah. do that. Last year, our recipient uh, was Joe Torrey, who I worked with for 11 years. Um, and I was honored to be able to uh, inform Joe of winning the award and Joe was very moved and very touched and I just sent the ballots out yesterday to our voting panel of 18 longer you're on the panel yeah. and you have not returned your ballot yet, by the way. But, <laughs> hey um, I think you could probably get that done today yeah, yeah. And we, we, <laughs> have about a, we have 12 finalists uh, which include uh, help me here Rachel Robinson Sandy oh Koufax gosh. Bob Uker, uh, well, yeah, sure. Dusty Baker Jim Leland uh, was added to the ballot this year uh bud selig uh just a tremendous amount Sir, of incredible uh, names incredible names and someone's going to come away with, as our 2024 recipient which is our fourth annual lifetime achievement award so listen uh, you know uh, we maybe we'll get to the story of uh how I got involved when I was sitting in my high school guidance counselor's office, but he asked me, what do I see myself doing when I'm a grown-up? Well, I gave him the first one, and if he had said, well, that's unrealistic, which he kind of said, if he had said, what's your second choice? I really, honest to God, would have said, okay, I'm the editor of Baseball Digest. Not the editor-in-chief, just the editor. Well, what was the first choice? Well, might as well get into the story. Well, yeah, we got to go there now. You well, got me intrigued. To, to set up the story, um, I had gone to a parochial school. So that meant I sat in the same desk for six, seven hours a day. And when the subject changed, you just put the one book away and you took the other book out. It was very structured, whatever. So in high school, we moved to Yorktown Heights, New York. Happenstance number one. I moved from Mount Vernon, New York, 35 miles north to the country, and I go to Yorktown High School. My freshman year, I could not acclimate. I was a horrible student. How far is this from New York City? Uh, 45, 50 okay, minutes. Okay. Okay. You were a horrible student? I was a horrible student. Really? It was Why? A, it, I, I, well, first of all, I think I had ADD. Mm. But in those, in those days, he doesn't pay attention. Me too. Yeah. But, okay. There's three of us. But I, I also went from a very structured thing to having beautiful girls say, do you want to protest the war with us? Do you want to work on the bonfire? Do you want to do this? Do you want?" So I, I was focusing on everything else except my studies. So to become a sophomore, I had to take two courses over again in the summer at a nearby high school. So I would get on the bus every morning in the summer while my friends were going to the pool and the lake and whatever. I'm going to Lakeland High School and to pass these two courses. So now I'm a sophomore. Now something happens that literally changed my life and I it did not resonate did not resonate with me at all. In August of that summer, 1969 maybe, 68, 69. I'm going into my sophomore year. My guidance counselor from my freshman year was a man named Richard Swales, very nice man. Uh, he got named principal. Okay, it means nothing to me, but I'm getting a new guidance counselor. Now, how they selected what guidance counselor you get, I don't know. Maybe it was alphabetical, uh, maybe well, whatever. Right. But I was given to a man named Forrest Buddy Dowds. What a Dowd. cool name. Buddy yeah. Dowds, well, wait. <laughs> so I... I knew Buddy Dowds. He was the football coach. Uh -huh. His father was the first ever coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Come on. Absolutely. Uh, here we that. go. Here's that full here circle. Here we go. There, okay. so, that, it's coming. Yep. All right. So, and when I told Buddy Dowds back two, three months ago, I'm moving to Manaka, which is where he's from. He's from that area. Oh my gosh. Uh, he, he was floored. Huh. So, I'm 
first week of my sophomore year, I'm sitting in the office of my new guidance counselor, Buddy Dowds. I can still picture the scene. I'm on the side of his desk. He's sitting there with his white shirt, sleeves rolled up, tie and done with the tie. I can still picture it. And he's looking at what I called my rap sheet, which was actually my grade, my grades. <laughs> and he's like, wow, we, we've got, a, Richard, we've got a problem here. He said, uh, at some point he said to me, what do you see yourself as? You can do anything you want. What are you doing as a grown-up? Now, I know that whatever I answer, I want to be an airline pilot, I want to be a construction worker, I want to be a school, whatever it was, his response is going to be, well, that's very noble, but to do that, you're probably going to need a high school diploma, and you're not off to a right, very good start. Right, right, right. But my answer completely changed my life. I said, that's easy, coach. I'm the public relations director of the New York Yankees. Stop it. Yeah. Stop the fight. True story. I thought, get Bud Dowds on the phone right Stop now. Stop the fight. So the first thing he said was, wow, that's awful. I told him exactly what the PR director. And you're a sophomore. I'm 14 years old. I didn't even know what a public relations. Well, that's, that, that's wild. But that's I knew awesome. who it was and what he did because ever since I became a Yankee fan, eight years earlier when I was eight or ten, I'd listen to the games on the radio or on TV and they and Phil Rizzuto, like, oh, Bob Fischel has walked into the booth to tell us that that home run by Joe Pepitone was, uh, that's a good Rizzuto, by the way. No, not really. I was going to say, so, so, anyway, Rizzuto, so, Hey, Pepitone, so, that's, a, that's what's you know, in the cigar. Hey, one white. One <laughs> you want a cup of coffee? So, so I knew what he did. I said, coach, he does the media guide. He does the game notes. He answers the fan mail, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I know I can never grow up to be Mickey Mantle, but there's no reason I can't be Bob Fischel. And he looked PR at me guy. and he said to me, all right, I'll make you a deal. If you can get your grades up and you can keep them up, you think you could do for my football team what this guy Bob Fischel does for the Yankees? Well, when do I start? So <laughs> that was I, a nice challenge, I, that I, is. I, I, walked yeah, in, I, challenge. I walked into that office as a disinterested, underperforming student. I walked out of that office with a job. I am the public and relations big responsibility. of the York He County. created a job. Yeah, and I you. and he said we never had a PR guy before you and we never had one after you. We huh. never had we had a media guide. He tells people if if you walked in today, Bud Dowds for the next half hour would tell you he had a media guide with pronunciations and with you know hobby it was unbelievable. I, he would say to you, in all my years of fifty years in, in being a guidance counselor and a teacher, I've never seen anything like what happened. He goes, I sat there at my desk and he goes, you know the movie, uh, Butch Cassidy, when he says, who are these guys? I'm sitting there saying, who is this guy? But anyway, that was my love. That was my avocation. So that changed everything because I then meet a man who's a local sports writer and I called the stories into him, the game, then it was basketball and it was baseball. His name was Stanley Shallot. And my senior year, starting to think about colleges, but colleges are, are not thinking about me. So <laughs> Stanley Shallot tells me, hey, I got some bad news for you. I said, well, what's that? This big guy, giant of a man. Uh, I, I'm moving. I'm leaving. I am just accepted a job as the sports editor of the DeKalb, Illinois Daily Chronicle in DeKalb, Illinois. Okay. He goes out there. Life goes on, and he calls me up, and he said, hey, you need to come out here and see this university that's in DeKalb. 25,000 students, Division One, just started as a Division One program. Um, you got it. So I went out and visited him. Now, he takes me to NIU, and I'm with royalty. So I'm going to the luncheons. I'm in the locker room at the basketball game. The week before I went there, the basketball team beat Indiana, who was ranked fifth in the country, by 19 points. Oh. And then now they're ranked 19th in the country, and they got this great All-America basketball player Man. who I met when I was out there. I mean, you know. So uh, Jim Bradley, who, yeah. went, who left NIU to play for the, got, got okay. declared That's ineligible. Funny. He went to the Kentucky Colonels, was a member of their world championship team. But... Um, so I, I, I go to Northern Illinois University. And before I go, he leaves that job and he goes to Winston-Salem, which was a good thing because now I'm on my own. You know, if I want to, I'm not, I'm not going to work at the Chronicle on weekends with Stan Charlotte. I got to make, so freshman year, I kind of got acclimated, 
you know, just did studies, this and that. And then sophomore year, I went over to the Northern Star, the student newspaper, and um, I got hired as a reporter starting out on golf and tennis. I knew nothing about tennis. The, the score was, you know, 30, 15, 15 this. I would just say I was 30, 15. Yeah. I, would, I, I was horrible. But then they put me on football. I'm flying to the West Coast, uh, basketball. Uh, and then I was a resident advisor for a year, so I didn't have to pay uh, room and board. Senior year, I was the radio voice of the Huskies for that year, football and basketball. Um, I kind of learned my trade. And that catapulted me. You cannonballed is what you did. Well, you know, you look back, it seems that way. It didn't seem that way at the time. But I'll never forget writing a letter to Bob Fischel, the PR director. It was in 1972. It's my freshman year. It's the end of the first semester of my freshman year, asking for a summer job. And in those days, you didn't call them internships. You just, I wasn't looking for a summer job. And I still have the letter. I've since framed it. Uh, New York, you know, I remember getting the letter in my yeah, mailbox. Right. You saw that heading? Holy yeah. cow, this is it. And it said, Dude, there's nothing available. I'll keep your resume on file. But frankly, I'm not optimistic. A, a major league front office is very small. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, you know, he, he might have had a thousand of these letters. He might have had 200 of these letters, whatever. So, uh, I later learned that, no, he, he, there just weren't any jobs. You know, I might have been the only one that, uh, yeah. because Bob Fischel's assistant at the time, Marty Appel, who's now a, a very good friend, he said when he wrote that letter, they happened to, somebody walked into Bob Fischel's office and said, what are we going to do with all this fan mail mantle left for the off season? He goes, well, this kid sent a letter, call him. And, ah. and he ended up getting the job. Ah. And it, but that wasn't the case when I was, ah. when, I, when I did it. So now I'm in New York. The, the Yankees are, I got a degree in journalism. The Daily News isn't going to hire me. So I worked part-time for a local newspaper writing feature stories. And then another piece of happenstance. A guy that I met. By the way, I love the term happenstance. Well, yeah. That's good. Wait, is, it, is it that or is it divine intervention? Well, you also it, worked your tail off and took well, advantage of a big or, opportunity. And maybe somebody up above was like right. my grandfather or whatever. Always, always. So... I, I, you know, when I was the sports editor of the Northern Star, I'm in that Hall of Fame too, by the way. But, <laughs> hey, but, hey, Brownie, right? Yeah, but I, think, I think at the Northern Star, if you work there, you're in their Hall of Fame. But anyway, um, I was I was the sports editor in the summer because by staying out there for the summer semester, one, I could be closer to the girl that I was dating who lived in Illinois, and two, I could take less credits during the regular semesters and just string, you know, lessen the load. So I take six credits in the summer and I was the sports editor of the star, which published three times a week in the summer. And you had to fill like two pages three times a week. Well, there's nothing going on. There's no sports. You can only do so many previews, so many. So I would find stories to write about that I could put in the can. And one of them was a guy that lived in my town was making baseball cards in his basement. Like, he was making cards of the 1927 Yankees. He bought all these photo files, which is something now you couldn't do because they would cost thousands of dollars. But in those days, there was no value. So he'd go to this defunct newspaper and buy their sports photo files, and he was putting out baseball cards. I did a story on him. So my senior year, he started a collector's magazine because he wanted to compete with tops and put out cards of the current players, which you can't do, they had a license, but he did it and he got sued and whatever. But he started this magazine, Collector's Quarterly. So he had done three issues, I had read them all, very amateurish, but you know, and he calls me over to his house, he says, I've decided I'm getting out of the magazine business. It's not what I thought it would be, I didn't get the response I wanted, blah, blah, blah. I need you to finish off the last issue of Collector's Quarterly. And, and he hands me this tray with all this manuscript and photos. And because in those days you didn't do it on a computer, right. you pasted them on a thing and you made a plate and all that. Now, the reason that the current editor didn't finish the magazine was because he went off to college. His editor was a high school senior. His name was Keith Olbermann. 
oh, which God. you may know. So I, I, tell you, I do the last issue and I had a blast doing it. He gave me, you know, sit down, $150, which was like, holy crap. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, I, and I said, I, this is what I want to do. So I tried to convince him to keep the magazine going. But I said, you can't put out a collector's magazine. I know you want to put the baseball cards. The, 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 the reason you did the magazine was to put a centerfold of baseball cards to promote what, you know, the full set. I said, you, you can still put the cards in the middle, but you're, you're narrowing your audience to collectors. There's no, there's no you know, large, full-size baseball magazine. There's Baseball Digest. It's a piece of crap, <laughs> so, which is funny. <laughs> but quality-wise, <laughs> quality yeah. it wasn't full-size. It was newsprint, and you know. So I convinced him to change Collector's Quarterly to Baseball Quarterly, which would come out four times a year, and we put the cards in the middle, and we did it. So we did one issue, and some person, I don't remember who it was, says to the both of us, Mike Aronstein, a genius, by the way, and myself, wow, this is really good. How, why isn't it on the newsstand? And I think our answer was, well, because we have no idea how we would do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, we, we put an ad in his little circular and took subscriptions. So the guy says, well, you, well, you, you know, you, there's got to be a way you can find out how to put this on the newsstand. And Mike says, my uncle Selig is a magazine wholesaler, which means he was the <laughs> local guy that all the magazines would come to. And then he would send them out to the local, you know, five and dot, whatever. So we went and met with uncle Selig, who was a guy right out of central casting with the cigar in his mouth and the apron. And, <laughs> and he says, uh, yeah, this is pretty good. You'll need a national distributor. So he sets up a meeting for me in the city at cable news with these two gentlemen they take me to lunch first business meeting i've ever been to in new york city they take me to this restaurant smith and walensky's and as i walk in the, the maitre d calls me over and hands me a, a jacket because you had to wear a jacket now those days are gone so i'm sitting out there with some crappy waiter's jacket on and i'm showing them this and they really liked it and they said okay we'll test it give us ten thousand copies and put a color cover and get rid of these baseball cards blah blah blah, blah. ten thousand copies holy crap. so mike says we can't do it i'm paying you know, but it turns out they gave us a printer that is based in mississippi so it turns out that ten thousand copies was going to cost us a whopping twenty eight hundred dollars uh because you're printing so many. So we yeah. tested it, then we went to 100,000, and that's where I really kind of like... You went from 10,000 to 100? Yeah. Wow. Over a, two, a year or two period. I don't know if it was from 10 to 100, but it, we ended up at a, printing 100. You know, you put them on the newsstand. We ended up with 22,000 subscribers. We sold another 40,000 on, uh, on the newsstand. But after five years or so, I said, I, I got to get out of this because if you don't have advertising back then, and I couldn't get the advertising because the circulation to me was monstrous, but to, to a, you know, Chevrolet, it was nothing. And who's your audience? Like somebody pointed out, great, if you had 60,000, if you were a photography magazine, 60,000 would mean a lot to an advertiser because we know that they buy film, they buy cameras, they buy this. What do we know about a baseball fan? Oh. Is he eight years old? Is yeah. he 80 years old? What is he buying? So And no analytics, no data. Right. Yeah. So uh, bottom line is I closed, turned the door. I sold my subscriber list to uh, Newsweek, who was starting their own sports magazine. So that took my big liability was the subscriber list. Uh, and I closed the door. And I went, you know, I, I first went to work for a food service magazine. So now I'm out of sports and I, I'm not very happy. <laughs> but then a job opened up at Major League Baseball as the, the assistant PR director under Bowie Kuhn. And, you know, as I said to someone in a news, local newspaper interview when I was doing Baseball Quarterly, if nothing else, it's a very expensive resume. Mm -hmm. And that turns out what it was because I became known. You know, I, you know I, 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 I mean, one of the things I'm most proud of is we created the, the MVP awards for the league championship series. Come on. Because there weren't any. 
Boy, so I went to Major League Baseball. I still have the letters. So yes, we will authorize you to be the sponsor. And we gave the first you one. You may have to, done it again, by the way, with the Lifetime Achievement. Well, you know. We'll see. But we had one with baseball quarterly, but it only lasted a year because it was the year I... Uh, Bill Veck was the first recipient, by the way. Huh. And Bill Veck, who comes to New York to accept the award at Gallagher Steakhouse, he calls me up and he says, uh, Rick, I'm so honored by this. I And do you mind if I bring... Two friends along? I said, you can bring whoever you want. You know who his two friends were? Hank Greenberg and Larry Doby. Gee. <laughs> I mean, so I'm sitting at lunch with Bill Vack, Hank Greenberg, Larry Doby. I mean, come on. I mean, wow. You're in so, heaven. So, so and, oh but here's another story. And I'll try to make this quick, but please don't. At the end of the at the end of the at the end of the decade of the seventies, we devoted an issue to this the team of the decade. And I had a hundred people from throughout baseball, writers, broadcasters, Hall of Famers, club executives. I remember Bud Selig had a ballot all um, to pick the first baseman of the decade, the third baseman, and we had a player of the decade. And And what what decade is this? This is the seventies. Seventies. So we also had an article that Keith Olbermann wrote. This is just an article. The top, the 10 greatest moments of the decade. Hmm. And Hank Aaron's 715th home run was the moment of the decade. Again, happenstance, Hank Aaron hired a marketing agent to, you know, because his career's over. He wants to get, he did some TV, he did whatever. And this young man went to the same high school as me. His do the, the, the marketing agent. The marketing agent went to, the same went to high Yorktown school. High School a couple of years, not too far behind me. Somebody was watching out. All right. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I end up having Mike Ehrenstein, myself, the marketing agent, are having lunch in Yorktown Heights, New York, with Hank Aaron. <laughs> I mean, I'm, all right. So <laughs> I, I tell the marketing guy, by the way, the next issue is going to be the players of the decade of which Hank finished second. Who, who was Pete number Rose. one? Ah. Pete Rose, okay. This is a tough company. Now remember, Hank Aaron only played six of the 10 years of the decade, and two of those years, he you know, didn't play full seasons. Right. So he really wasn't the player of the decade. Yeah. But I said, but he did have the greatest moment of the decade, and we're going to honor the... The, the player of the year and our players of the players of the year and our player of the decade at Gallagher Steakhouse. He goes, well, when are you going to give Hank his award? Now it wasn't an award, but me being somewhat smart said, well, we'll do it at the same time. Brilliant. You know, what a business move right there. Right, yeah. So he's all excited. Hank's going to come. We send two first class airline tickets, this and that. And he did. That's beautiful. So here comes Pete Rose, Keith Hernandez, and National League Player of the Year, uh, Don Baylor, America, and, and here comes Hank's marketing guy. At, this is at Gallagher Steakhouse on February 2nd, 1980. And he comes in, he goes, Rick, come here. I said, what? He goes, Hank is not gonna be here. He's asked me to accept the award on his behalf. I said, well, why isn't he gonna be here? He goes, I'll explain that when I accept the award. Okay, now Bowie Kuhn, was presenting the award. The commissioner of baseball at the right. time. And I had, because they had an issue, Hank Aaron and Bowie Kuhn, because remember, Bowie Kuhn did not go to the game where Hank Aaron hit the home run because he had a previous commitment. But people might not, right. we, we get into that a little bit. There, well, there was a little debate about that yeah. too. Yeah, but so. listen, I worked for Bowie Kuhn and I say to this day, that was a terrible misstep. Yeah. You know, this is, well, I can't follow him around the country. Well, the night he hit it was Hank Aaron night. Yeah. You could have been there on Hank Aaron yeah. night. Yeah. He sent Monty Irvin. Send Monty, which put Monty, a prince of a human being, in a terrible position. Uh -huh. Got booed. Monty could have gone to Cleveland and you go to Atlanta. Aaron hits the home run. It's a big story that Bowie wasn't there. I asked the, the marketing guy, um, Bowie Kuhn is presenting the award for player of the decade to Pete Rose. Um, do you want someone else to present it to Hank or he'd like to present Hank? with this award, but I want, he says, I've spoken to Hank, Hank's good with it, him and the commissioner are good. Okay, so I've, I've covered my bases. But I said, I'm not having Bowie Kuhn present this award to the marketing guy. Right. I'll present it. 
So I presented it. He gets up there at the mic. I'm still sitting there. You can see the pictures on the dais. The media's all out front, cameras. And uh, he proceeds to read a telegram from Hank Aaron that says, because I don't agree with the voting process, the lack of opportunities for minorities in baseball, oh, wow. and because the commissioner didn't see fit to be there when I, hit, I cannot accept this award. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna go grab him and throw him down. And then I looked out and I saw every flashbulb going off, guys writing, I'm like, Rick, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to your magazine. Wow. So. How about Happenstance, right? Okay. That, yeah. For That's the next crazy. week, this was the biggest sports story in the country. Everybody wrote about it. On an award that didn't exist, right? right? And <laughs> everybody, Jeez. sadly, crushed Hank Aaron. Really? That this was inappropriate that he, you know he once again he was now i will tell you right now hank aaron in my mind who called me the next day and apologized he goes not for how i feel but for any embarrassment it may have caused you and we were friends till the day he died mm -hmm. and i did things for him and he did things for me that's amazing and you know one time i did something for him in like 2009 where we commemorated when bonds was going to break the home run record we got Delta Airlines to name a plane, the Hank Aaron 715. Oh, and when, wow. he got, when he came to the airport, he sat down next to me and goes, I might have known it was you that was behind uh, us. Wow. So anyway, he apologized. We're good, whatever. I'm like, thanks, Hank. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> oh, no, don't worry. About it. No apologies. So it was a big story. I think Hank, I felt horrible the way Hank got. I could show you the clippings, you know. Mm. Um, mm. But... Uh, it happened. It was tremendous publicity. And who knew that this little magazine that I started in my basement would Incredible. facilitate. But, you know, that got me the job in Major League Baseball. I had built up a track record. I had created the the uh, LCS Awards, the Lifetime Achievement Award, the Player of the Decade. So I went to work for Bowie Kuhn. Wow. What do you think, by the way, speaking of... Uh magazines what do you think of uh, what's going on with sports illustrated and and how can quite frankly uh, even a baseball digest continue to exist when it seems like everything is leaving in favor of well the, online the, the print magazines are a, a challenged breed but i remember sports illustrated when i got involved in uh in uh in baseball. Well, we all grew up with uh, Right, but I remember it on the inside. Like, yeah, I'd go yeah, to their offices. Yeah. Or, they used to have a man named Keith Morris. And I first knew of Keith Morris when I was in college and the sports director of the radio station. Every week they would send a reel-to-reel -reel piece of tape and there would be three or four features narrated by Keith Morris. Maybe one was an interview. Where he, and I would run them sporadically on my radio station. Um... I met Keith Morris when I'd go to Yankee games. Now I have the magazine. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to the ball games. I'm, I'm in the clubhouse, and he would walk around and he would put them in players' lockers. Oh, Reggie, here's the new sports uh. I'm like, oh. So then I started doing that. Hey, <laughs> with baseball, you know, he never gave me one. Nicest man in the world never gave me a magazine. Wow, man, um, that nice. But anyway, no, couldn't he didn't collaborate. Even, couldn't do but, anything. Yeah. Else. Wow. But you'd go to their offices. They would throw lavish parties to uh, for all the local PR directors. They would and they would bring in top name comedians and 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 their offices were you know on the top floor on Avenue of the Americas. Their overhead must have been astronomical. Mm. We have no overhead. Mm. We have no over. I would say that if not for the new ownership of Baseball Digest, Baseball Digest would not exist because they're not paying rent. They're not paying for waste baskets, for computers, for this and that. They've, they, they've streamlined everything where all the money is in the product. Now, can Sports Illustrated get by with a circulation of 100000 No. Can Baseball Digest? Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's two very, very different business models. I don't know what happened at, at Sports Illustrated. You'd have to take a college course to learn what happened from point A to point Z where we are yeah. now. I'm not convinced it's completely dead yet, but uh, clearly something went amiss you know, in the last 10, 15 years. But I, I will say one thing about Baseball Digest. Our, our largest... 
a distribution point is Barnes and Noble. We, we are pretty much in every Barnes and Noble. Now, we're in the Giant Eagle in Cranberry, but we're not in the Giant Eagle in, in, in Rochester. But so, um, but we're in every Barnes and Noble. And we, we can kind of pinpoint our improvement because Barnes and Noble, this is the last report, which probably goes through the last issue of last year. Barnes and Noble has 3,900 titles. Now, three years ago, it was 4,300. So since COVID, 400 of that 4,300 have bit the dust, and now there's 3,900 and change. Of all those titles in sales, Baseball Digest is number 103. Wow. That's pretty good. That's, that's really pretty good. That's pretty good. We're the largest selling sports magazine in Barnes and Noble. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with the business model mm -hmm. and the editor. Oh, <laughs> ah, the not chief. in that order. Yeah. Don't, but don't you guys love still to. I, I, I think it's, industry, I think it's coming back. Agree, but don't you love having some, even a newspaper oh. in your, in your hands? I, I'm telling you right now, you, you mark it on your calendar right here. The, the, the book, actual, like, let me hold a book, not on your Kindle or your iPad, the magazine, all of that is going to become a collector and people are going to have it. I've, I have thousands of books saved in my uh, basement right now. I put it in storage and it's nice to give it as a gift, but also like, I really believe that all those things are going to come back around because you can't just always sit there and look at your device and there's something vintage about it. Well, picking up a magazine as a kid was Michael, awesome. I, I hope you're right. I worry that younger people today, it's so foreign to them mm -hmm. to read a book, to learn history, uh, and it's almost becoming accepted uh, yes. that okay. I worry about that. But let's just say we're a niche product. Exactly. Okay. Oh, you're, you, you, you're focused on an older audience. That's fine. If I had to sell 500,000 of every issue, we'd be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. But the untapped market for Baseball Digest is still so large that there's enough of them out there to make us not only successful, but, you know, to thrive. Uh, you know, which, when I look, when I, when I got involved with Baseball Digest in 2018, People in the game, Bob Costas, pe people of that ilk, maybe Greg Brown. I didn't know you still existed. I, 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 I read it all the time. Are you still, you know? That's right. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had people, and I can't think of their names now, but name baseball people thinking that somehow we brought it back. Yeah. That it was gone. It never was gone. Yeah. You just lost track of it. Yes. And a large fault lied with Baseball Digest. How about your decision, by the way? It's, it's a, how did it happen where Baseball Digest goes from that almost pocket size, thick, as you say, black and white printed right. to, yeah. to, a, to a regular magazine, well, Sports Illustrated well, type to, look? It went to color first when it was still... And then, and then the glossy the stuff. But I this this decision predated me by six or seven years. But my understanding is they decided that you know just exposure on the newsstand uh, you couldn't survive as a as a digest. It gets hidden, literally. It gets hidden. Um, I had somebody come up to me recently and said, "Hey, I love baseball. You got to go back to the, the pocket size. You got to go back to the pocket size." I said. You don't know anything about the magazine business, so please stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, just so you on, can yeah, put it in your yeah, pocket. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sales have enough. never been better. Uh, we're the you know number one hundred and three out of three nine hundred. But but I'll go back to the pocket. Yeah. 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 I really wonder about did you even kids aren't this some somebody isn't like we're I'm holding the uh, November December twenty twenty three edition of the right. Baseball Digest. We're here with Rick Sorrell, the editor in chief, and on the cover. Cool looking shot of Ronald Acuna, Shohei Otani, and Mookie Betts. Uh, don't you think kids want to visualize that, see it, hold on to it? I, I cut it out and put it on their wall. Yeah, I, I used to. I used to rip yeah, on cover yeah, sports. I used to do that. I literally used to do that. Yeah. You know the nicest thing. I've ever I, seen. I, I'm, I'm very big on small compliments. Small little things. This pats was on the back. Pats on the back. But for the magazine, not for. Oh. So I send a copy. To broadcasters, I'll, Michael, you'll be it. I'm in. But 
Greg, I collected you, that as a kid. You get a, you get a, uh, I got a copy. And one of the people, one of the broadcasters that gets a co complimentary copy is Michael K, who's the voice of the New York Yankees. Mm. So Michael K sends me a text. I don't know, six months ago. And, uh, he goes, I got to tell you, my son, Charlie, who I think is like eight, nine, absolutely devours baseball digest. Oh, isn't that great? I said, well, I'm switching the, I'm switching the subscription from your name to his. Yeah. And he goes, oh, that would be great. Oh, so, that's I mean, amazing. Charlie that's, K oh, that's great. likes baseball digest. That's good enough for me. That it's not just, you know, 70-year-old Rick Cerrone people, that, you know. So I'll, I'll give you a story that'll make you feel good. Um, it was probably a little bit predated your time since you came in in 06, but as a kid, my grandmother used to buy me old baseball books and she, she did everything out of magazines. Her name's Jacqueline and I ended up marrying a Jacqueline, huh. uh, full circle. But I, I used to get those and I had two learning disabilities and I'd get them and I was so enamored with sports yeah. and especially baseball that was the one thing that I would practice reading on yeah. on my own right. and I just moved and I, um, my parents moved out of our old timey home and I got a bunch of them and I have them and it, just looking through them brought back so many memories yeah. of you know this literally helped me be a that better a student and everything else but it gave me the love too and, yeah. and it reminds me of my grandmother because yeah. she's the one that subscribed for me year right. in year out as part of one of my presents it was right. it was outstanding I mean that's well, that's what you ha have that maybe people don't realize is you created a connection. I lost her about, I, th I guess it was in 2014. And every time I see yeah. Baseball Digest, I think of my, That's what it's one of my favorite about. people in the world, right? Well, I will tell you that the biggest threat to Baseball Digest and other publications like it is the unexplainable rise in costs of everything. <laughs> Paper mm. through the roof. Mm. Shipping through the roof ink and there's always some reason well they've taken the pigment that they used to use for ink and now they're putting it in the covid vaccine so ink is more, oh, crazy oh, stuff like that what there's um, always a, there's always a reason there's always a reason i do think that companies are taking advantage mm -hmm. of the situation that we face but we are facing significantly rising costs and at some point do you mind it, disclosing that like but, what like a mag like like not how much the magazine costs, but like maybe the cost difference that you've seen over the last couple I, you years. You know what? It, I would say in the last ten years, the cost has had to go up thirty percent. Wow! Which is you know, and we're 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 operating on a very very small margin. But um, hey, look, I'll do it as long as they'll have me, um, and um, I think I'm making a contribution. Um, my associate editor lives here in Pittsburgh, Jim Lachima, who was my director of media relations with the Pirates. So. We have a great time doing it. My art director is uh, in, in the Chicago area working remotely. And we have, you know, two proofreaders, copy editors. And that's basically it. Wow. What, what you're looking at there, you know, a very small group of people. Now we have writers and photographers all over the country. You know, we'll tap in. Oh, we want to do a story on Josh Hader. I got my guy in Houston. We want to do a story on Garrett Cole. I got my guy in New York or, you know. Um, so... And there have been some features on on Pirates. I remember you did a cool feature on Steve Blass. We did Steve Blass. We did Kent Tocolvi. We did uh, uh, the two catchers from Venezuela. Yes. Uh, I think it was my first or second issue. Uh, and we'll, uh, we've, we've, done, uh, we've done Ben Charrington. He, he was the Q&A. So uh, Jim Leland is going to be proud of Jim Leland with, with, with a baseball life. Hall of Famer. The, uh, I want to get into that with you too, by the way, Rick. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you went from the commissioner's office to yeah. the Pirates. How did you... Well, uh, can I ask one more yo, uh, question about Baseball yeah. Digest? Of course. You came in 06, right? Age of social... No, no, no. 18. Uh, 2018. 2018. So you're right in the cusp of social media. Oh, yeah. So yeah. how... How did that change your business model? How did that help, hurt? And how much do you attack it and how? Because I, I see, like, there's a trend right now that the SEOs and the blogs, right. if you don't know what that is, right. the blogs are really growing, right. really, really right. growing. Is that helping? Like, how has it changed over the last couple of years? Because it seems like that's ever evolving. It's not a world I'm all that familiar with. We have Facebook and we have... And our face, our social media numbers are very significant. I mean, in terms of you know hits and whatever you call you know impressions and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, 
I've taken Twitter from 500 followers to 5,000. It's very hard to get. At one time, it was very easier to get followers. Yeah. It's for some reason it's not that. They want you I, to buy ads. I use yeah. it to promote the magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I also, I also, I also repost a lot. Like if I see something like yesterday was Hank Aaron's birthday or Willie Mays day or uh, something that MLB puts out or MLB Network or a team, I'll repost it because I want people to see Yeah, you're a team player. That's um, awesome. You know, we've also, we're also the, the go-to place that if someone passes away in the baseball family, we always do a, a, a we remember. We just mm -hmm. did Jimmy Williams and uh, I want to do Al McBean today or Al tomorrow. Al McBean, former pirate. Yeah, so... Uh, and we do that in our January, February issue where we do tribute. And we try to list every name of everybody connected with Major League Baseball. Even if you're, you know, working in the front office. You know, we, uh, two years ago, there, there was a story. I read it in various places that this iconic hot dog vendor from the Oakland Coliseum had passed away. And he was so well known that the team put out a statement and Tom Hanks made a comment on it that we put his name in the tribute page and his wow. father called and was in tears that that's and you would do this for and he also bought 50 copies so oh, that didn't wow. hurt either yeah that didn't hurt at all <laughs> but um, thank you very much you know yeah. but you know we try to remember women from the all-american girls professional baseball league uh you know one of the negro leagues uh so uh you know i'm i'm really proud of what we do that's amazing thank you yeah you went you went from from the commissioner's office again we're, we're jumping around but to, but got to get to your years well to, to, to the with with the pirates and, and how you got that well, interview and the job well because it wasn't the yankees no your dream job Remember, was the yankees. that's my dream job I I've, I've applied there i've done interviews and I, I you know you seem like you're very persistent about well i had kind of given up on some people the, might call it obnoxious no uh, well, yeah, persistence. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. well hold on this because this is important and i tell people this when i talk to college students and i taught at two universities where You've got to be persistent without being a pest. Exactly. You don't want to be the guy, oh, God, it's yeah. Sarone again. Oh, it's yeah, Sony. Yeah, yeah. But you got to be persistent. You have to have but just know the right touch. When I, you're not calling too often. Right. Yeah. But what happened was I left the commissioner's office after the 86 World Series where I watched the ball go under. I had the best seat in the house to see the ball the, the Mookie, go under Bill, Bill Buckner's Buckner. glove. And when the ball was hit, I said the word out loud, trouble because it was like a pool cue. Uh -huh. And I now see the video, and I saw an interview with the late Bill Buckner where he said his glove didn't open. He couldn't open his glove. His glove was so old. Wow. But if you see it, his glove Take care closes glove. on its own. Wow. Anyway. Still say one of the most first overrated one. gaffes in the history of baseball. Oh, come on. How overrated? They had another game left. They were down it was tied. The game yeah. was tied. Yeah. It was a tie game. Yeah. Please go into this a little bit the, further. The, the Red Sox can win that game. Well, they, so they lose the game because of the ground ball, right? No. The Red Sox lost the game on the I, I know ball. that, but they still had another game. So that, yeah, that was game right. six, right? Game seven, but the, but the Will Shears would have been over. I understand yeah. that. All right, but, okay. okay. We'll, yeah. That's a further well, show. The Mets put on the scoreboard. Congratulations, yeah. And how about the Sox. wild pitches? Yeah, well, I know. Who was it? I know, but I know Bill Buckner was wrongly persecuted. That's First of all, point. he should not have been on the field. That's right, but... but because he should have been putting... Uh, Dave Stapleton was the ninth inning guy, and he didn't go to him. He wanted Buckner on the field for the last out. Anyway, okay. I had a great view of that. Okay. And okay. you said, oh, no. Sorry I brought or that trouble. up. Trouble. trouble, yeah. Trouble. Anyway, trouble. trouble. Anyway, but um, after that World Series, I made a decision. I'm now married to baseball Karen, who worked in the commissioner's office in broadcasting. And... Um, a woman asked me out to lunch. She was the promotions director for WNEW AM radio and WNEW FM. Mm. AM was the music of your life, Frank Sinatra, and FM was rock and roll. You know, and the AM station also was the home of the New York Giants and Penn State football. Okay, she goes, I'd like you to have lunch with me, and I will tell you that this lunch is going to change your life. I'm like, okay. My wife is like, all right. You, yeah, you show up to a lunch when somebody says that. Yeah. It's Rose, either going to be really good or really yeah, bad. Rose I guess. Polidoro. And I'll never forget. Now, this is 1986. This is pre-WFAN. This is, this is when sports talk shows were 
Myron Cope for three hours a night on one station and maybe somebody on another. New York had two. They had Dave Sims on WNBC and they had Art Russ Jr. on WABC. And Rose Palladoro sat down and she said to me, we at WNEW believe the future of AM radio is sports. And we're going to acquire as many sports properties as we can, and we need a three-hour-a-night show to tie it all together. To be Well, so, they nailed that one, didn't they? Well, yes <laughs> and no. So she said, we're going to have a show from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, five nights a week. We have a host. We want you to be the producer and book the game. And you and the host, Richard Neer, who was the morning DJ. Richard Gear? Neer. Oh, Neer. Just kidding. And um, <laughs> so I met with Richard. And we mapped out this idea of a show that it was going to be like the USA Today. It's not going to be a guy on a phone. My guest is Freddie Pacheco. Yeah. Uh, we'll take your calls. Yeah. We were going to be, we're going to go from this. Here's the Yankee report. Let's go to Jack O'Connell in Tampa. Here's the Mets report. Action. You know, boom, 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 boom. Around, yeah. And every 20 minutes we would break to give scores and news. Which the station manager said, every 20 minutes you're going to break? For so... Um, I started doing that and then I went out to the Super Bowl when the Giants played in the Super Bowl and Richard stayed back in the stadium so I was kind of anchoring and we brought Dave Jennings the former Giants punter out with us and we were you know you saw Radio Row it was yeah. two, Radio Row was uh, me and NBC that's it so um, the station manager really liked it and he said I want you to go on the air with Richard so it's you know you be, you'll be a co-host so now I'm co-host of a radio show okay so come July this is January we're doing this now and I'm not really enjoying it this is I missed baseball I wanted to work for a team I you know um, I don't like criticizing people and whatever so I get a call from a woman that worked for the Pirates that you well know Nancy Rich now Nancy and I worked together at the commissioner's office when she was an executive trainee I believe and she landed a full-time job with the Pirates to be their centennial coordinator in 1987 what, what is that well 1987 was the hundredth anniversary of the Pirate franchise okay. as the Pirates in the National League um, and she was coordinating all the celebrations they were going to do for that. Too cool. And one day she calls me up, Sarone. She, she's never called me by my first name. Sarone. Uh, the Pirates have just fired the Vice President of Public Relations and they're doing a search and your name's come up. So you should put your name in the running for the Vice President of the Pirates. It oversees media relations, public relations, community relations, the scoreboard, everything. PA. And I talked to my wife and regardless <laughs> we talked it over and she said look I know this is what you want to do I don't really you know it's Pittsburgh yeah, yeah. And, and she had a career in baseball as well so I went down to do the interview and I in one day I interviewed with three people Bernie Mullen who you know the, with, uh, with the senior the, vice the president MVP. of business Sid Thrift the general manager and Mac Prine the president and I got on a plane to go home that night and said well Karen doesn't have to worry because I'm not getting this job I mean what, what made you think that because it just didn't go well it didn't feel right I, I don't think they connected with Isn't me that funny you yeah know, it like, really is um, I, I, when Mac Prine was interviewing me he turned the chair around in my hotel room so he's sitting on the chair backwards and I'm sitting on the bed and I thought I was going to start to cry and like, he was one of the most intimidating it? human beings Mac Prine the late Mac Prine who great was great guy he, oh, he pulled a he prison was, move on he was you. The, uh, the, the the consortium that, that bought the pirates a bunch of businesses in Pittsburgh to save them they needed to appoint one guy as president it was Mac Pine who was uh, president of uh, Ryan Holmes right yeah, exactly I'm and he was this big Ryan tall Holmes. man and, and he, he was, was a college football referee and every time he uh -oh. called you into his office you were like on the witness yeah. he grilled you you had to be ready for everything oh it was unbelievable yeah the fact he turned his chair around like oh, like, it, like it's in the like prison the interrogation yeah well, he's like, everything, like, everything did I you said, get a spotlight on you and you're no, but everything I said he was like well I don't agree with that yeah. we're not doing that yeah. I'm like I got no chance yeah and there was like <laughs> there was like twenty other candidates. This was like a big search, and then I. I but what I, about the other two interviews? Did those go? They were okay. They, they weren't as intimidating. But you know, <laughs> Sid Thrift was like it was all about Sid. Oh yeah. It was like I was going to be his personal. Sid was quite a character, a genius, uh, and helped turn that. And look, let me say this right now. 
and I like to think I was part of it, you were part of it. That group of people that was there in 1986, from Bernie Mullen, to Sid Thrift, to Jim Leland, to the players, they saved baseball in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Wow. 80, saved, 86 to what, 92? Well, 93? you know, they, they, they started the ball rolling. Okay. They saved, this franchise was teetering on it, it the one brink foot, of... One foot out of the city. I mean, it right. was honestly... So, oh, wow. Yeah. So anyway, I, I don't remember the call that I got, but I get the job, right? So I fly down... And I'm not starting yet, but I went to a game. They, t they wanted me to come to a game and announce that I was the new vice president. And I'm in the owner's box. And I meet a gentleman by the name of Carl Barger. Nobody more responsible for saving this great franchise than Carl Barger. He was the lawyer. But he put the 13 groups together wow. that bought the franchise. Okay. I mean, just a tremendous achievement that you can get these companies to commit. I think they committed like a million dollars each. He later helped start the Marlins. The Marlins. So Carl Barger in the owner's box comes over me and goes, come over here. He walks me into the corner of the owner's box and he's got a scotch in this hand and a, a cigarette in this hand. His 50th cigarette of the Yeah, and he says hour. to me, I want to tell you why we hired you for this job. I said, oh, I... I you know, I'd like to know. You're probably really wondering. He says, we didn't hire you for your media guide or your press notes. And I'm like, wow, I'm pretty proud of my media guide and my press notes. <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, he goes, and his veins are popping. He's so emotional. He said, we hired you to convince the great city of Pittsburgh that this great franchise will be here for another hundred years. And wow. I'm like, that's all? That's it. Yeah. That's it. So, but, but, oh, that's but, easy. But, order but there. I give him credit because if that conversation doesn't happen, I don't have those marching orders. So I start thinking, that's powerful. well, how do we convince a market we're going to be here for 100 years? First thing I thought of was, well, let's solicit the All-Star game because you're not going to get it for four years. So at least that shows we're not going anywhere until 1992. And then we couldn't get it for 92 because we couldn't get the hotel rooms. The whole city was every room in the city was taken by the international barbershop quartet so no. yeah so story. they bumped wow. us they bumped us to 1994 but i was the the, the director the head of the all-star game committee the other thing is i went to bernie mullen who was the senior vice president of uh, business operations i said Oh, I got to give give credit where credit's due. Every day I walked to work on a game day, there was a young man standing outside the door. And then he'd move over and stand outside the press gate. And he would say, will you sign my petition to get a statue bill for Roberto Clemente? You know what I'm talking of about, Of course. Right? He's there every, every day. day. Every day. Joe Vogel. He That's knew. amazing. Joe Vogel is the reason that Clemente statue exists. Now, Thank Joe you, Vogel. Joe Vogel. Joe wow. Vogel. Baseball Joe. You see him yeah. in the ballpark every day. Yeah. He's Jersey now. So, yeah. He suffered a massive stroke yeah. many years ago. That's the same no, guy? Yeah. no longer talk. Yeah. yeah. I love Joe. He writes yeah. me Neil yeah. every week. Right. He, so, he was the driving force behind wow. that. After a while, I walked in, and I said to Sally O'Leary, the, the secretary that had been there, I said, you know, why isn't there a Clemente statue? I mean, oh, well, we've tried. We've tried. Go and look at the files. And I looked at the file. Clemente statue, 1975. Clemente statue, 1979. Clemente statue. Yeah, that's the one where the guy absconded with all the money. And like, mm. I said, so I said, we, we've got to be at least try. So I went to Bernie Mullen and I said, I think we should try to erect a statue in honor of Roberto Clemente. And he said to me, how would we do that? Do, we, do you know anything about a stat I said, well, the Steelers just directed one for Art Rooney Jr. Why don't I meet with J uh, Joe Gordon at the Steelers and maybe mm. he can get... So Joe Gordon, bless his heart, was phenomenal and basically gave me the, you know, what they... We, they need, you're going to need a quarter of a million dollars. Blah, blah, blah. There's Hero. There's, there's this. There's... So we just started. We got it designed. We had a... Open to the public. You can bring your... You know whether it's artwork or an actual statue, and we once again that's brilliant. We picked this woman named Susan Wagner, who I think at the time did the Hall of Fame plaques. She might have done the Rooney statue, and she did the magnificent statue. But I'm only looking at it this big. And so they made like little like yeah, model statues. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. One of them that somebody did the model crumbled. 
<laughs> when she was presenting it. Yeah, that's, just, that's, that's probably, probably, that's probably we, mine. We won't choose that one. Yeah. Oh, but it wasn't going to win anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I saw it before it crumbled. But anyway, so, you know, I was named, they said, we want you to be chairman of the, we have to raise $250,000. And they said, you're going to be the chairman of the fundraiser committee. I said, I, I, I think you need a name. So they said, well, let, I'm going to call Dan Galbraith, the former pirate owner, and see if he would co-chair it with you, which he graciously did. And, you know, they raised the money. Like, I'd like to say that I was ultimately responsible, but a year before the statue was to be unveiled, they called me in and said, you no longer work here. What? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, to be to be continued. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's that's uh, coming up. Yeah. Mm. So stick around for the next episode of Hold My Cutter. Rick Sarone, the great one, the chief. <laughs> chief. <laughs>